Good morning, church family. Welcome to today's service. Whether that's on our 1604 campus or live streaming on one of our social platforms. Don't forget to register your attendance by filling out one of the cards at the end of your row, or for those watching online, click on the link in the chat. My name is Sharonica, and if you're new to Northern Hills United Methodist Church, here's just a few things you can expect in today's service. In a few moments, we'll start our service with singing, a quick message for the children joining us, followed by a message from one of our pastors. We know that there are several options for you these days, and we appreciate you being here. Don't forget to follow us on all our social platforms, Facebook and Instagram, and don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Now as we center ourselves for worship, please stand as you're able as we focus on the Word of God as it is sung, spoken, and preached. Good morning. I'm over here. <laughs> some, some looking at the pulpit going, I, I can't see. <laughs> We're going to start with a good old spiritual gospel piece. I woke up this morning and this welcomes you stomping and clapping and all kinds of stuff. Let's go to God in prayer. God, this is your time 
for us. We're here to let you know that we love you and that we want to serve you in all we do and all we say. And we pray that this time of worship will be pleasing unto you. And we uh, thank you. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, please join me in the call to worship based on Psalm 4. Answer me when I pray to you. My God, who does so Make things easier for me when I am in trouble. People, how long will you turn my honor into shame? How long will you love the false and deliver new lies? Selah. Selah. You know that the Lord has chosen for himself those who are loyal to him. The Lord is my praise him. Amen. Please be seated. Going to, as you remember, we're talking about legacy and how important is legacy in our lives. And uh, uh, right now, uh, Pastor Bob is actually out of town because he's precisely creating legacy with his granddaughter who's being confirmed today. So when we knew that too, we realized who has been a person who has created legacy among us. And of course, who came to our mind? Pastor Milton Lewis. So we are so happy. We are so happy that he's coming. Let me, let me say things right. We are so happy that Sally Lewis is here and brought Milton. You know, that's how it goes. <laughs> and uh, for some of you who do not know who's Pastor Milton, uh, Pastor Milton was the senior pastor of this church for 30 years. And actually, it was his life as well as Dudley in a mix of how God was using them to be able to move this congregation from Higgins Road and then dream about this 1604 location and then dream about the ministry center. So it has been a blessing to work and see how God has been using them in this place. I don't know if you also know this, Pastor uh, Milton, as also I think is more a Sally thing. But uh, there was an Easter on Higgins Road where it was packed. And there was a family who came late and they were needing to find a seat. And what happened is that your family gave up that seat and sat in the floor so this family could sit together. So this family was the family of Pastor Abdon Garza. And it was the very first time that they were in church. And for Pastor Abdon, that stay on his mind. And now it's Pastor Abdon Garza in our family. And I know that Sally, because Sally has a gift of radical hospitality, and you have left that legacy here, Sally. It's very important for us to be able to have that radical hospitality, and that is coming from your heart, and you planted here among us. So I'm not saying welcome, I'm saying mainly welcome back home. God bless. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rafina. It's good to be back, and it's uh, good to be a part of the history of Northern Hills Church. Uh, anybody that can live with Dudley Harrell for 30 years <laughs> has done something significant. And I, I claim that significance, Dudley. It's good to see you. We had a great time together and a lot of great memories, a few bad memories, but mostly great memories <laughs> of, of coming back here. And uh, as Lupina said, many of you are familiar faces to me, uh, and, uh, but some of you are not. And that's as it should be, because I've been gone for five years now, and it's good to see that new people have come into the fellowship of this church. Let's go to God in prayer at this time. And remember, too, if you have a prayer card, uh, you can drop it in the offering tray when it comes by. Let's pray. Dear God, it's good to be in one another's presence. Where two or three are gathered, you are there. And we are gathered in your name today. And so we recognize and claim and invite your presence among us. We are glad that you love us. We are glad that you are here. You're here in our moments of, of knowing and being awakened to your presence. You're here when we are far from you. We're here when we're, you're here when we're so busy we just don't pay attention. But God, you're always here. You're omnipresent. And we recognize and thank you for your presence in our midst today. We pray that our service today will be in accordance with your Holy Spirit and what would bring honor and glory to you. We thank you for being such a great and merciful and loving God. 
We thank you that your love has, has been revealed in your son, Jesus Christ, and that we have the opportunity to, to experience that love, to know it, to live in the confidence of it, and the hope that it brings to all of us. So we thank you, dear God. We pray today for those who, who need uh, special favor and special grace. There are always people who are in places of uncertainty and doubt, people who are suffering and in pain, people who are depressed, people who just don't know what next step to take. And we trust in the guidance of your Holy Spirit, dear God. We trust that as disciples of Jesus, we will be attentive to those in need. And we know that you as, as God will certainly be attentive to the needs that are presented to you today as we lift them up to you. We pray for the wisdom and the guidance of your Holy Spirit as, as Northern Hills moves into the days ahead. We, we're, we're in uncertain times in many ways, but yet we're never more certain of your love, your presence, the direction and guidance of your Holy Spirit. So all of this we offer to you today in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite the children up. Ms. Catherine Hosher is leading us in our children's time this morning. Talk about legacy. I was a little girl sitting at his feet many years ago. So, here they come. All right. Oh, you brought your Bible with you. All right, my friends, this is really loud. They did put new batteries in here. All right, so we are talking about what happened after Jesus came back, right? Because we know that Jesus came back at Easter, and he was in human form. And then all his friends were talking about him, and all his friends were sharing the good news of Jesus. But did you know that there were some people that were upset about that? There were some people that were mad that Jesus came back. Yours is probably back here. And there was a man named Saul, and Saul did not like that Jesus came back. And Saul was very grumpy about it. And he was not very nice to the people who were happy about it. Is that a good choice to make? No. We love Jesus, don't we? And we want to hang out with Jesus, don't we? And Saul was not very happy about that. And he was very, very mean to the people who were following Jesus. And so, but God had a bigger plan for Saul. Do you know that? Just like he has a big plan for you, for your life. You may be really teeny tiny and really young right now, but God has a plan for your life. And God had a plan for Saul's life. So one day, Saul was walking to a city called Damascus with his friends. And he was going to arrest Jesus' followers, meaning he was going to put his followers in jail. Is that a very nice thing to do? No, he was going to be mean. That's not very nice. And so suddenly, a bright light, like the brightest light you have ever seen in your whole life, shone down on Paul. And he fell to his eyes, and he covered his eyes. He fell to the ground. And then it says, Paul, Paul said a voice from the light. Why are you being so unkind to my followers? Do you know who that voice was? Who was that voice? It was Jesus. Yeah. It said, it was Jesus. It said, get up, Paul, and go to the city. To Jesus, someone will come and help you. And when Paul stood up, he couldn't see. Paul's friends had to lead Paul into the city. Do you know why he's called Paul now? Because God and Jesus changed his name. He couldn't see for three days. Can you imagine not being able to see? Do you think you might learn a lesson if God was trying to teach you a lesson and said, you cannot see for three days? I think I would be like, um, okay, God, I'm, I'm listening now. Because sometimes don't you get consequences when you make bad choices? Yeah, yeah, sometimes when we make bad choices, we get consequences. And, and Saul was making a bad choice, and so he got the consequence of losing his eyesight for three days. But then he changed, and the Holy Spirit changed his heart, and he got a new name, 
And then he became Paul, and he changed his heart, and he started loving Jesus. And he was one of the biggest followers of Jesus. And he brought so many people to love Jesus after all, because that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. He changes our heart. He makes us, and he helps us to make good choices. So when we have the Holy Spirit who lives in our heart, he helps us to make good choices. Isn't that great? Isn't that awesome that we have a Holy Spirit and a Jesus who loves us that much that he helps us every day? I think so. You ready to pray? All right, here we go. Dear God, thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for opportunities to learn from other people who have made bad choices. Thank you for stories that um, help us to learn the ways that we can change our life around. Thank you that the Holy Spirit comes into our life and changes us for the better. Be with each of us every day. Help us to continue to look for opportunities to share your light in the world. It's in your heavenly name that we pray. Amen.
want to take a moment to welcome those who are worshiping with us online today. We thank you for your participation and greet you in the name of Christ. I greet the in-person congregation in the name of Christ and invite you to stand now and share greetings with one another. I'm going to be really honest with you. I don't know how all of this works. All I know is that you're going to hear something that you really need to know. And whether God says it to you through me or through the choir or through a song, I don't know how it's going to work. But in the silence, in the spoken word, in the sung word, God is going to say something to you. And you're not going to be the same. You're going to leave here today with hope in your heart, a skip in your step. Something's going to happen. This is God's love for you. Get ready. Let's dive in now. God is ready. Are you? Y'all are just entirely too friendly. You know that. I'm just joking. I'm just, you're wonderful. I appreciate you being that welcome and open and helping. Thank you. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to hear God's word for us today as we sing this hymn called Jesus is All the World to Me. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him I would fall. When I am sad, to him I go. No other one can cheer. My name is Elizabeth Stewart. Today's scripture reading is 1 Timothy 1, 15 through 17. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. 
Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's amazing to see how she's grown and changed. Gosh, that took me a moment to, to realize who that was. I think if you uh, had someone in your life when you were younger, or some ones who gave you guidance, gave you counsel, shared wisdom about life with you, someone you could uh, be yourself with and talk to, I know you've count yourself fortunate if you had someone in your life like that or some persons like that. I think by the same token, in our senior years, if younger people come into our lives and we have an opportunity to give guidance, help, suggestions, advice, uh, just share the wisdom from our lives, the good and the bad, the trials, the, the successes that we've had, that's a special thing too. And that's what we find in, in this letter these two letters, in fact, from Paul to Timothy. It's a mentoring relationship. The Apostle Paul, whose conversion Catherine described in the children's time, uh, is now at the end of his earthly ministry. He's nearing the end of his ministry. He's nearing the end of his life. Remember, he's going to say in 2 Timothy, my time has come. I'm, I'm at the point of departure. And he has somehow found a special relationship with this young evangelist, Timothy. I don't know how he found time to, to spend with Timothy with all that he had to do as a missionary, the traveling, the, implant, the planting of churches everywhere, all the struggles that he went through as an apostle. But apparently Timothy had captured his affection. Timothy's a young evangelist. Paul's an old missionary. And Paul in these two letters shares a lot of guidance for this young man. He shares personal counsel. For example, he says, take your share of suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Ministry's tough, especially in those days it was tough because you were subject to persecution. It's gonna be hard, it's not gonna be easy. So take your share of suffering as a good soldier. It comes with the territory, Paul is saying. Paul knows as the voice of experience, that's how it works. He gives him counsel about his youth. He says, don't let people look down on you because you're young. Don't, don't think less of yourself because you're young. You can be an example to others through your speech, your conduct, your faith, and your purity. Be that kind of young person. Don't be a kind of young person that just says, well, I'm young, everybody, everybody who's young just has to have a good time. You take responsibility and take seriously your place in church, your place in the body of Christ. So there's all kinds of good counsel that he shares with him. He gives also instructions to Timothy about how to lead his churches. He gives instructions about the qualifications for church leadership. If someone wants to be a church leader, here's the kind of person they need to be. So it's just practical instruction. He gives a lot of instruction. I, I was reminded reading through these letters again uh, about widows and the importance of taking care of those who are dependent on others for their support in their life. It's important that the body of Christ do that. And so you teach your church or churches to do that very thing. He says, tell the rich in the world not to be dependent upon their material wealth. That's fleeting. Don't rely too much on the, he doesn't say give all your money away, but he says, tell the rich not to depend on their material wealth, but to rely on God and to be rich in good deeds and to share their wealth in generous ways with others. Those are just practical instructions that he gives to Timothy. But also here, it, it, it can kind of sneak past you, but several places, Paul says to Timothy, these are foundational truths. These are the bedrocks that you are to build your ministry and your life upon. Apart from the individual advice, apart from the, the counsel, the instructions as a church leader, how to go about leading your church, here's what you build on. 
And he has this little phrase, this saying is sure and worthy. You can count on it. You can take it to the bank. It's solid. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Nine words. Christian doctrine in nine words. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's your life that you build. That's the message, the proclamation that you have to share. Christ Jesus. Faith is built on a person. There are many such uh, statements about Jesus Christ in the New Testament, and, and they almost all start with Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. Christ is the title signifying the anointed one of God. Jesus is the name of a human being in whom God chose to dwell. It's personal. It's about a person and not much else. When I came to Northern Hills, I, I wanted to, to stress that. Somebody said when you, when you start at a place new, you have a short period of time where you can make a statement. You know, you can kind of define who you are and what kind of ministry or job you're going to do as the leader of, of this flock. And I remember the first six sermons that I preached at Northern Hills had the name of Jesus in them because I said, whatever else my ministry is going to be about, it's going to be about Jesus. I don't want us to get too far from Jesus. And trust me, we know from the experience in our own denomination in recent years, you can get way far from that, way far from Jesus and all the stuff that can come, up, come down. So I want it to be about Jesus. And one of the first phrases we used was Christ-centered. Remember that? Christ-centered and Bible-based. We're based in Scripture. We don't worship the Scripture, but we're based in it. We worship and live for and obey Jesus Christ. He's central. In time, we added spirit-led, and that became our phrase, Christ-centered, Bible-based, and spirit-led. But first and foremost, always Christ-centered. It's about a person. It's not about religion. Paul says in Corinthians, I have chosen to know nothing but Christ and Him crucified. That's it. Whatever else there is, that's the core of my faith. And Jesus Christ has to be the core of of the church, Jesus Christ has to be the core of our personal life and faith. Came into the world. He didn't start out where we started out. We, we started out here. He started out somewhere else. In the beginning was the Word, somewhere else. But that Word became flesh, came down to where we are. You know, we're not climbing the stairway to heaven. The stairway to heaven is being descended it's not how we get up the stairway because we can't get all the way up the stairway. It's about who came down. Jesus Christ came into this world for a purpose. He came to where we are. Have you seen those uh, commercials? Uh, they were prominent during the football playoffs, the NFL playoffs, a lot of those. Call, it's, they're called He Gets Us. How many of y'all have seen those commercials? You know, they're, they're somewhat controversial because uh, it won't take too much time to go into, but... but it, in terms of what they present of Jesus, I think they're spot on. They're, they're commercials that are designed to show that Jesus came into the mess of this world. And he made his full and complete identification with the mess of this world, that is, with us. One of the commercials said, he did not come to hate. He did not teach hate. He washed feet. And whatever else is going on in those commercials, I think they're great ways to try to get people at least interested in this person, Jesus. He was unique. He was different. He came into this world for what purpose? To save. Now think a moment what the word save means. It doesn't say he came into this world to improve us. It doesn't say he came into this world to pat us on the back and tell us what good people we were. It doesn't say that he came into this world to say, I really understand. It's all right. You'll do better. You'll get through this. It's, it's, a, it's a powerful word. The word save means to rescue. I love, it's providential you saying, come thou found. He to rescue me from danger. Interposed his precious blood. This is a rescue mission. This isn't like, I'm going to be your best friend and walk with you through life. You're, you're fine the way you are. You've got a few little weak spots and we can work on those and improve you as we go along. The word save means 
rescue. When I, was a, when I was a kid, I think I was maybe about 13, me and I and two other guys went up into the mountains where I live, and there was this creek that we decided we were going to wade across. And it had rained uh, pretty much in recent times. So the creek was really flowing. There was a really strong current. And the place we chose to wade across it, uh, right down below were these rapids, you know, where you could see white water and rocks and all kinds of danger down below. And I was a kind of a lightweight kid at the time. I'm not so light anymore, but I was at the time. Skinny, lightweight. My buddies were bigger, stockier guys. So we start across this creek, and I'm like, y'all go first. See, so I'll get over there. And so they, they get across, no problem. They get up on this rock. It's sort of hung out over the other side of the creek. And I start easing my way across, and I'm burying my feet in the, in the dirt and in the sand to try to keep myself anchored. And I get within two or three feet of the rock, and my buddy's up there on it, and the current just swoops me off my feet. And I reached out my hand, and this is a true story, they grabbed my hand. And all I could say was, don't let go, don't let go. <laughs> I don't know if I would have been killed or not, but I definitely would have been injured if I had washed on down in, into those rapids. The current pulled me, my feet up underneath the rock. I could not move them, it, it, it was just stuck. And I'm just saying, don't let go, don't let go. And they didn't, and they pulled me up. That's salvation. Okay, that's not self-improvement. That's not patting me on the back and tell me, if you just try a little harder, you can get out on your own. That's salvation. It's rescue. It's deliverance. He came to deliver us. The, the sheep in the wilderness was lost. The sheep in the wilderness was in danger. Okay? Somebody doesn't find that sheep, it's dead. It'll, it'll succumb to the to the conditions of the wilderness or the predators in, in the wilderness. It's a rescue mission. And who did he come to save? What does it say? Christ Jesus came into this world to save who? Sinners. Who are sinners? That'd be everybody. That'd be you and that'd be me. That would be all of us, sinners, everyone. Paul says in Romans, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the writer Frederick Beekner says, to say that all have sinned is to say that all are human. If you're a human being, you're caught in this malaise, this life-threatening disease called sin. And we are the ones he came to save. It's interesting to me that in much of the contemporary church, we don't like the word sinner. We don't like to be called sinners. If somebody suggests to me that I'm a sinner, I kind of get on the defensive. It's like, I'm no worse than anybody else. I don't know who you're talking about. I'm just as good as everybody else. I've got my weak spots, sure, but I've got my strong points also. And I think on balance, my strong points outweigh my weak points. What do you mean calling me a sinner? It's, it, it's really hard for us to, to, to grasp and to accept because we're, we're, we're steeped in self-esteem and the importance of feeling good about ourselves. I'm a sinner. Here's the thing. If you're not a sinner, then Jesus did not come for you. If you're not a sinner, you have no use for Jesus and he has no use for you. What did Jesus himself say? He said, those who are well have no need of a doctor. It's those who are sick and he came as the great physician to heal the sickness of humanity, the sickness that sin has caused. And here's where I take a cue. Paul says he came to save sinners, and then he says, what? I'm the worst. Now, who's, who's saying this? This is the great apostle. This is the great missionary. This is the man who, who did more to establish Christianity in the known world of his day than anyone since. Greatest missionary, I would argue, that the church ever had. He gave his complete life to establishing churches and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says, I'm the worst, because it goes back to the conversion that he had persecuted the church and he never really got over the guilt of knowing what he had done to persecute the church in the name of Pharisaism, in the name of self-righteousness, and his, and, and his hatred of the early Christian church. But be that as it may, I'm thinking, well... If Paul puts himself at the top of the list, then I'm probably somewhere down the list. 
<laughs> okay. I, I may be way down the list or just a few spots down the list, but I'm on the list. I'm one of the ones he came to save. Sin isn't just about the bad things that we've done. Sin is, a, is this power, Paul describes it, that, that sort of holds sway over the earth. It's the mess into which we're all born. And we're all, it's, it's like a disease we all have. If I, if I have a mosquito bite, I can put some ointment on it and a Band-Aid, it'll probably get well. If I have terminal cancer, I need somebody to help me. And sin is like cancer. It's not like a little mosquito bite that we can take care of on our own. Paul realized that he came to experience that. Our word in the church for it is grace. I love the word grace. It's my favorite word in the Christian vocabulary. It says God did something for us that we could not do for ourselves. God loved us so unconditionally that while we were yet sinners, he died for us through his son. He gave me something that I could not achieve on my own or, or with my, with, uh, in my own strength. Does he improve our lives? Certainly. Does he make us our best version of ourselves? Yes. Does he console and comfort us in our times of need? Absolutely. But the initial thing Christ Jesus does is save us from sin. This is foundational. Paul says, build your life, build your ministry on this truth. Live it, preach it. In Christ, God came to us. In Christ, God did something good for us. In Christ, God loved us in spite of ourselves. In Christ, God saved us from sin, saved us from ourselves, and from the death that sin inevitably brings. Live it, Timothy. Preach it. This is foundational to everything you are as a human being and as a minister of God. Amen. Let us respond to the spoken word by repeating the affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. Would you stand with me, please? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. want to share with you is that every month we're going to have a time for a mission spotlight. And today we want to give thanks for the different ways that God has been moving and just empowering the ministry of the youth among us. So I want to show what happened last week at 6 p.m. in this place.
Renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of the world, and repent of your sins. In other words, I do be honest if you do not want to get distracted to continue growing and maturing. Would you be willing to continue growing and maturing? If you do, because you do. All right. We are thankful for our youth, amen. It was really moving when we were asking them, do you know that you are going to be serving the church? Tell us some of those places where you can serve. And to hear them just telling all the ministries of the church, we could see that, yes, they are our legacy. But at this point, they are also a legacy for the next generation. That's why in this church, we want to invest in these ministries and in this congregation. So I invite you right now to pray for our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks because the work and ministry is not just for one generation, but we give you thanks because this word transforms the lives of the people right now, and it will continue to transform the lives of the people in the future. And this is why, God, we bring to you tithes and offerings so that we can live a legacy of that grace that you have shared to all of us and an opportunity to share that with the world. We pray all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Check on the announcements that we have for this week. 
Here's what's happening in the life of Northern Hills United Methodist Church. Hi Northern Hills, it is springtime already if you can believe it and that means summer's right around the corner and we have a lot of exciting opportunities for our students to participate in youth activities this summer and those include our high school mission trip, youth camp, as well as our city camp missions experience for our middle school students. But to do that some of our students need a little bit of financial help and that's where you the church comes into play. So we're asking you to check out our mission wall. And the really cool thing about our mission wall is each envelope, you'll see a number on it, but the really special thing about the envelopes is the letter that's inside. We've had our students write a letter and those letters tell you a little bit about that student and that student's gonna earn a scholarship towards one of their summer trips. So pick up an envelope, give it an amount as you feel comfortable with, and that will help each of our students to have an awesome experience with one another, but most of all, help them grow in their relationship with Christ. Three. Our mission goal here in the sanctuary is at the back. As you can see, it is over there. There are still envelopes in there. So I encourage you, like, let's see if today that one is empty so we can be sure that all our youth have a person praying for them and supporting them in this great opportunity of sending us missionaries around the world. Steve. <laughs> We're going to end with another foot stomper hand clapper. <laughs> to support and to, to say thank you, Milton, for the words for your sermon this morning. And this is victory in Jesus. And if sing loud, right? <laughs> and good. Please stand, and we're going to sing Victory in Jesus, and as we sing, I want to ask if you are ready to join this church, please come down and let Pastor Lupina know while we sing if this is your day to open your heart to Christ then do that while we sing. I heard an old story How the Savior came from glory How his hands live on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood atoning When I repented 
Saved from sin by Jesus, saved to eternal life through Jesus. Now may the love of God and the grace of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with and keep each of you on this day and evermore. Amen. Amen.